Good evening. Thank you, everybody, for being here. I'm Susana Castro, the Ward 4 City Councilor on the Brockton City Council. This is our Ward 4 meeting. I'm really, it's a really busy night in the city tonight, and I'm really so pleased that you're all here. Thank you for coming. Thank you for caring about Ward 4. I have some remarks that I have prepared, but I think we're going to go right into our speakers. We have two speakers this evening. Uh, we have the city clerk of, this, of Brockton, Timothy Cruz, and he's going to speak about the workings of his, his office. He has a crack team in his office that support him. And then we have um, on the mayor's staff, there is a terrific social worker by the name of Jasmine Bradshaw. And she is going to speak to us about the very interesting work that she does. And she's also brought handouts. Actually, Clerk Cruz has brought handouts. So I won't delay any further. Here is Clerk Timothy Cruz. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it was great to see you all. I'll see you later. I did throw some handouts out. Uh, what I printed out is really just what we put in the budget book at the beginning of the year. Uh, when we do the budget, which is online, we're not yet, 2025 isn't yet, we haven't approved it yet, but the council will be doing that in June, early June. But part of the process is to put a mission statement, and I think I handed them around, I don't know how many people got them. Some of it is just, I mean, the mission of the clerk's office, to present courteous service to the public. I mean, some of that is so much fall we're all. But what we do is very important to the clerk's office. We, I have two different budgets and two different jobs, basically. On the city clerk side, we're the, I'm the keeper of all records, other than building records, things like that. But birth certificates, death certificates, marriage certificates, and anything like that, in effect, we have done this, this year alone over 12,000 certified records. The certified records are records that you come in when you need to get your real license or when any, any officer tells you you need to buy a birth certificate. It has to be certified by me. And uh, we've done over 12,000 records this year. I have a tremendous staff uh, that I'm very proud of. The uh, council can back, back me up on that. One of the things that I'm really excited about my staff, we speak in the office six different languages. And uh, we, can, we can get more and we can translate even more if we need to. About the only language that's spoken, spoken in the city that right now we don't have somebody on staff is Haitian Creole, and we're working on that. But other than that, we have staff members, multiple staff members that speak Cape Verdean, that speak three different dialects of Spanish, two different dialects of Portuguese. Um, anybody that comes to our county, we're able to take care of. And in fact, many other offices in City Hall, including the mayor's office, who does have a Haitian speaker, helps us. But they come to us quite often because my staff is so, so does such a great job working with the public on that. Um, so, so again, I could read the whole uh, the whole mission statement, but we're there to to set, to serve all the public. And one of the things that we run into is all records are not public records. People think they are, although a little bit scary in the state law or in the federal law. Birth certificates are public records. Anybody can come in and get anybody's birth certificate. Almost anybody's birth certificate. They're public records. So be careful what you do and where you leave records around. But anybody can come in and get a, a public record, uh, birth records, marriage certificates, death certificates are all public records. Uh, which sometimes the public is a little, uh, little surprised to hear. I was when I started. We process all marriage certificates. Uh, we process all the motor vehicle repair licenses in the city. And I will say down here in Ward 4, it's a particular issue with Councilor Rana Castro. Historically, nobody really was enforcing the laws on motor vehicle repair businesses. We do give the license. The license is given out by the City Council, and my office keeps track of all those records. We have worked very hard, but it's an ongoing fight, to clean up the motor vehicle repair businesses. Because, and in fact, here in Ward 4, you do have a preponderance of them. And a lot of them are a mess. But I will say that first thing we say to anybody that comes in looking for a license or a transfer, you should call your counselor and they have to tell you, don't, it's not going to be easy down the road for, because if you don't do what Susan asks you to do, 
It's not going to get through the city council, and you're not going to get your license. And we have turned down more than one that have not made it to the city council because we get people who think they can bluff their way through, but we don't allow it. And we do have a mayor's office now that has worked for years and years. There was no inspectional services department really in the city. This city council saw fit to put a, a full inspectional services department together and working with Deputy Williams for the fire department and the police uh, license agents. We're out there, not we because I'm not an enforcement agent, they're out there daily looking for, uh, looking for uh, violations. And it's still a mess in a lot of places because it doesn't happen overnight, but we're working hard to clean those up. If you have a place near you, uh, Wintello Street and Plain Street have a couple that we have started to clean up. It takes a while, but call us and we'll make sure that the right people get the information and we'll get them down there to uh, try and start, you know, we try to work with the people and get them to start cleaning up, but if they don't, we've started to get the word out that we will bring them into the city council to take their licenses away. And once that license goes away, it, it's gone. They don't, they don't get to come in and it's not a suspension, it will be taken away. So. Particularly here in Ward 4, I know that's a big issue. Uh, another thing that I am as a city clerk is the keeper of the city seal, which sounds like a bit of a joke, but people see all the time the city seal. The city seal is only specifically to be used on official documents. We do use it on some clothing for the city and on the side of the trucks, but it's, it's only used and it has to be used with my permission. People can't just decide to use the city seal. The city seal is what makes a document official for the city. If it doesn't have the city seal on it, it, it doesn't, it, it's not an official document. If you get a water bill without, especially in this day and age where there's so much, uh, so much fraud and online fraud, if you get things like that that don't have the city seal on it, or if it doesn't look right to you, call my office and we'll check it. And don't pay bills, particularly if, you, if they come up to you online. But that seal is, it, it's a little bit of a running joke, the city seal, but it's a very serious, uh, piece of paper and, and we, we treat it so. Uh, we're uh, the custodian of all, all city records. I spend a good part of my week answering freedom of information requests that come in and they could be, they can range from anything, anything to a letter that goes out. We've been in the middle of looking at some things that happened in 1952 right now and uh, for a family lawsuit but uh, it's we have records in the building that go back to 1848. Before that, you actually have to go to the library to find anything. Uh, 18, I'm sorry, 1843. And Mark Walden was able to start those records. So. <laughs> uh, just a little bit of interest on what, how busy my office is. At this point, this fiscal year, we're about 80% through the year, and we have brought in $391,000 as of last Friday. Uh, in fact, a motor vehicle repair licenses and, and body, motor vehicle body repair, $25,000 just in renewals. And we, we, some people are fighting us on whether we have the right to make them pay for a renewal. The reason we do that is also that every year we then have something to hold, them, hold their feet to the fire. So that if they come in and they don't pay for their, their uh, update, they don't get their license. If it's not there, if it's not on the wall, police officer can walk in if he doesn't see it, then he can ticket them and start the process of bringing to the city council complaints so that we can clean up the places or again. Uh, certified, certified records, $220,000. As I said, we've done over 12,000 certified records. Set by city ordinance, it's $24 a, a record. We've brought in $220,000, so much of the budget that I have is self-funded. And I think you'll find as you watch the budget here and some of the next, that a lot of departments have the same thing that the council can tell you and talk about. We have a lot of what you call revolving accounts. And those accounts are funded. And it's important that they stay funded fully because many of those, particularly water and sewer, there are out of town entities that are they're charged. In fact, they're charged more than the city. But if we don't keep the the water and sewer accounts up to what it costs to run those departments. The city budget, meaning the taxpayer, has to fund the difference. And then those people in Whitman and Abington and a few other places where and it's not a lot, but it's about 10 to 15% of the water and sewer users, 
they're getting away with not paying their full amount. So that's why it's important when you hear about a water or sewer increase, it's better than having it put on the tax bill because it, the people that are using it are the ones paying for it. And in many cases, like the BA pays for their water and sewer, but they don't pay a tax bill. So we want it on the water and sewer bill so that it doesn't come out of directly out of your pocket as a tax man. Uh, those are probably the biggest dollar amounts. Marriage intentions, $26,000. We brought in those intentions. Um, it, it's a lot of fun. Those are how many intentions happen. Also, as a city clerk, I have a justice of the peace and I have to be able to do weddings. And it's, I had two weddings today. It's one of the fun parts of being, of being a city clerk is performing weddings. And uh, they're so happy when they see me when they leave. <laughs> Sometimes, a couple of weeks later, I have had people come in the next day and say, I don't want, I don't want to take it back. It's, Sorry, we don't, you got to go over to the courthouse for that. We don't take it back. Once you leave the room, once I say, I, I call you man and wife, it's husband and wife, it's over. My, my part is done. Someday I can write a book about the weddings. That, that's uh, that's uh, the, mo the most interesting thing we do sometimes. I also have another part, another budget, so I am also the clerk to the city council. As, a, as many of you know, I'm a former city councilor. We have former school committee members here also. Um, my job on that front is to, by the clerk to the council, have to have the minutes prepared, have to have the agendas uh, prepared. And I have to tell you that I've been with, this is my third, third year as a clerk, and last year my president was Councilor McCastro. Everybody has a different style, but when it came to putting the agenda together, I, I could show you how many phone calls I have. Uh, there would be seven, eight, or nine each day while we talked about Susan's a detail person. I said, oh, yeah, we can do that. Yes, oh, we spelled that wrong. I'm sorry, we'll take care of that. And if, if, if I missed a mistake from my staff, which they don't make many, she certainly caught it. So, uh, so on the clerk side, it, it's keeping open, uh, open meeting laws, and it's very, we have a, there's a group of people around the country and in the city who they want to catch you making mistakes. We have a very good, uh, very good record. We have a, we have a, I'm proud of our record. And the open meeting law is so important. We, uh, we work very hard to make sure there's no violation of the open meeting law on the, what I call the city side. We don't handle the school, school committee meetings. They handle our own. But uh, all of, we make sure that all the meetings are posted properly. And by the way, via our agreement with the uh, Secretary of State or the Attorney General about seven or eight years ago, the official posting is now the posting on the website, which makes sense. We still have to make sure it's posted in our office on the wall outside. But the, the wall is an open 24 hours a day. The internet is. More people, not everybody, but more people can see the internet. That is the official posting. It has to be there 48 hours before a meeting, or sometimes longer than that, depending on what the meeting is. And uh, we have never had a violation since I took over. And the violation usually is just the Attorney General sending that you did this wrong, don't do it again. But since I took over, we've never had a violation. And I would never have last year because she wouldn't have allowed it. If it's not up right after I talk to her, it's, it's, I get a phone call. I don't see the meeting posted, so we, we work it. So, uh, and then part of my job as the clerk to the council, the way I see it, is to help the councils make sure they're prepared. I mean, coming tonight, this is not part of my job, but it's to help the council make sure she's giving the service to you, the constituents, that I tried to give when I was in Ward 1 City Council. Uh, it's to make sure that if they don't get the information properly, they can't get it to you properly. And I can tell you as a former counselor, one of the things that would go up my back is when somebody said, I didn't know about that. If you didn't know, I hope it's your fault, not ours, because if it's our fault, shame on us. And my staff and I take calls all day with questions about meetings and about uh, agendas and about how things work, how the process works. Happy to take any call, the number is on the web page, I'll give it to you. It's 5807114. But I'm, I'm always here to talk to any constituent that has a question, and I have many of the call multiple times. Um, and that's the gist of what we do, and I'm happy to take any questions. It's kind of boring to most people. I love the job, 
I, for those of you that are long time Brocktonians, so Tony Fioli was our clerk for 30 years. He left uh, three years ago and unfortunately just passed. The clerk before that for 26 years was a relative of mine and kind of a mentor, J.J. Lyons, who was kind of infamous. And in fact, he'd be saying right now, I don't need that goddamn microphone, I'll just yell. And that wasn't a yell to him, that was his voice, his tone of voice. So, uh, I certainly uh, take any questions you have. Yep. I have two questions. Um, if we wanted a FOIA request, do we send it to the city clerk by email? Email, and you can, uh, under law. So the question was, if you have a FOIA request for freedom of information, do you send it by email? By law. You can walk up to me and say, I want this information. And that is legal request. Now, if you do that, make sure I write it down on a piece of paper or something because, because that's not, I'm getting old enough to get it before I get to the office tomorrow. But by law, the request can be by verbal, by e email, or by mail. And any, or phone call, anything. You can, you can request the information that way. That's a great question. So those of you that, I don't know if you can hear, if you have a freedom of information request, how long do, does the city have before you get the information? And there is a little bit of confusion about that. The city has 10 days to acknowledge the request. It doesn't always mean you'll get the information within 10 days, but you have to hear from, so in other words, if you sent it to me, and as the keeper of the records, I get lots of requests that don't concern my office, I know where the record is, it might be the building, it might be somebody looking for a building department item or something. So we will forward it, and I always CC the law department on it too. We'll forward it to the right office, and almost always what I will do is email back to you, that record would be with the, let's say the building department. Uh, you're on that, they're on that, but you, we, the city has 10 days to acknowledge the request. Most of the time, you'll get the, the answer within that time too. If it's something that takes more, that takes more uh, detective work, because there are some things we get requests on that might not even be stored in the building, they could be old. As long as you've been re replied to, and now that doesn't then mean that we can say, oh, a year from now, we'll look at that. It still has to be in a timely fashion. But you have, within 10 days, you have to be acknowledged that you made the request, that it's being worked on, who's working on it, and there's also, confusion over costs. The, the state wants us to not charge when possible. And even if you're charged, you can't really be charged. I mean, some records can take days and days of research by two or three staff members. On paper, that would be thousands of dollars. You can't be charged that um, under any circumstances. I don't think we've ever charged out of my office for, for freedom of information. Occasionally, if it's a for a lawsuit or something, I think the law office might step in and say, you know, look, that was a big request. And it, but for the average citizen or anything else, and, the, and for the press, the press, it's supposed to be free. If you, We can charge, but I, we've never charged out of my office. I'm not even sure if I know how to, would know how to charge for it. So you have 10 days that you have to be acknowledged. And like I say, almost all the time, if, through my office anyways, you'll get the answer long before that. Because most things we can get into right away, and I just send it to you, depending on what it was. Now again, some things, there could be a question on whether it's a public record. Then I might have to get the law department involved and say, you know, personnel records are not public records. I, I can tell Patrick's ready to jump on the hill. <laughs> personnel records are not public records, things like that. I don't usually make that call. We would leave that to the law department. You would still get a record, but it could be redacted. But within 10 days, you have to be acknowledged that you've requested it, and again, in, in my office, unless I was out of the office, I almost always reply within hours of that day. I've received your, your request, I've forwarded it to this department, or if we're working on it, we'll get it to you forthwith. All right? Thank you. Just a minute, he was first. I have two questions. Yep. Of 
I could not. I believe I think I know where it is up off of Stonehill Street, but I couldn't. I believe it's up off of Stonehill Street, but I don't think I could direct you to it. You know what? I will look it up and I'll try and find the information. I don't know that. Could we direct people to Sachem Rock? And I don't, I'm not sure that I know where it is. Yeah, I, I will see if we can find that and I'll put something on the website about it. Yeah. East Bridgewater? Yeah. Right down by Dr. Bannerman's farm home. Is that Sachem Rock? In that case, it's right down by Dr. Bannerman's farm home, 106. Yeah. Which is now the senior center down there. It used to be old Doc Bannerman's house. So if you go down past the old uh, cotton mill, right down there, it's just on your road. Thank you. So I do know where it is. Yeah, I believe they all do, but most do. I'll have to look and see if there's any changes through the... I believe, yeah, he was asking if the birth certificates have the time of day. I believe they do. I'll check that. I've got information to get contact you. I'll check that in the morning and make sure. Yeah, you, you mean check in with us and I'll make sure. But I believe it's on there. Patrick, what do you got? Unless it's restricted. And a birth certificate that's restricted, 
is usually only because if a mother was unwed at the time of the birth and did not put the father's name on there, the only two people that can see that birth certificate are the person and the mother. And we've had grandmothers come in. We have people come in with, with letters from the school saying, we need a copy. Sorry, we can't. Love to help you, but we can't do it. Only with the judge's order, and that does not mean a probation officer. That does not mean a, somebody from the courthouse. A judge's order is the only thing that we can then do that for. So just so, just so you know that. It's a, most people, it doesn't come up that often, but in my office it comes up almost daily. And those are restricted records. Okay, yep. As the keeper of the record, do you also have, are you also in charge of boards and commissions records? Uh, not necessarily. We, I do make sure that they're being done properly, but for instance, the planning board, the, the planning department is supposed to have all the meeting minutes and, and records available. We are in charge of, as far as planning and zoning, the only thing we have is things get registered with us and the decision to register with us, and I have to certify after 20 days if there's been a challenge, a court challenge. Other than that, I certify that there's been no court challenge and the builder can come in and get his copy, but no. The other boards and commissions, so the Conservation Commission goes for the Planning Department, uh, the Planning Board goes for the Planning Department, Zoning Board is in the Building Department, they would have all those records. Now the requests quite often come to me, and that's what I mean that I would forward to them and keep a copy of myself. Again, I usually put the law office on there, just in case there's, because a lot of the other departments don't understand sometimes how quickly they have to answer, and, and I'll remind them quite often and just say, hey, I just forwarded you a, you know, a freedom of information. Um, you know, make sure you look at it. Uh, yeah. Those would be, should be in the mayor's office. Uh, I'm not going to say they are, you, you know. And in fact, they would just have minutes anyways for the most part. They don't have, well, the Women's Commission does have a small budget, so there would be some items where they might spend money. But uh, for the most part, it would just be the agendas and the minutes of the meeting. But we don't keep, we do keep track of the agendas because we do have to post them. So once we take them down, once a meeting's over, we don't throw them away, we file them. But we don't have all the minutes. Anybody else? Yep. What is, I issued a debt filing, I didn't get it from. I'm sorry. What if I did ask for a document and didn't get a response? March 14th. Uh, that was forwarded to the DPW. I will do me a favor. I remember seeing this, and I will check with the DPW tomorrow and find out why they haven't done anything. Okay. That's exactly why I try to keep my name on the on the thread, email thread, so I can sometimes remind the department, hey, I noticed that this isn't, and usually that will pop up. I didn't get a response to the email either. Check your email when you go home. Well, first of all, tobacco isn't governed by the city council, and 
which government might stabilize, and also what do you mean by, you know, just tobacco? I mean, that's all it said. So you usually get back from us, you know, what is it you're looking for? So we can make sure we're giving you the right thing. Because sometimes you could type up storm water and there could be, you know, 50 things and you want to make sure you're getting what you're asking for. So, but I am, I'll be in touch with you first thing in the morning. Thank you. But, um, I don't like that. So, Me neither. Yeah. I'm surprised you waited this long. It's over a month. Uh, but I'm available, and I do, I take a call. I'm available, uh, I'm usually there by 8.30, and I'm there until after 4.30, so. Uh, City Hall is 8.30 to 4.30, but I'm usually there before that, and I'm definitely there after that, so. Any other questions before I turn it over to somebody that does real work? Yeah. Thank you, everybody. I'm available, I'll be here, and uh, I am available anytime by phone, so. Thank you very much. Thank you, Claire Cruz. So, brief commercial break. The first thing is, Brockton Community Access was kind enough to come and record this meeting, so you'll be able to see yourselves on, on television on the various channels after tonight. And Estra is here doing the work for us, and I just want to say thank you. And the second thing is, on Sunday, May 19th, from 11 until 3, there's a free event at DW Field Park by the Gazebo Lawn. It's called Give a Hoot About the Park. It's a free community event that will feature live owl shows, lunch, bar delicious um, barbecue lunch, Lady C&J soul food, family-friendly activities, and opportunities to get involved at DW Field Park. I have some flyers for it here tonight. Please write that down and plan to be there. It'll be great. Thank you. So now I would like to introduce the social worker who is on the mayor's staff. She has a bachelor's as well as a master's in social work. Her name is Jasmine Bradsher. She is a, a, a wonderful resource on the unhoused and other social problems that are happening in our city. And I'm really, it's my pleasure to work with her and to introduce her to you.
also have a resource guide that we specifically give out to our in-house population that has a checklist on the back to make sure that they're kind of covering all of the different steps they need to make sure that they get access to housing. Um, I also oversee a lot of the social services grants for the city, so it's working closely with High Point, Champion Plan, and a few other programs to make sure that any grant funding that comes in from the state is being spent properly and that we're accounting for all that spending and that those resources are best fitting for the community. Um, one of the topics that we discussed in the last finance committee is a lot of what you're going to see on the handout that's on the table and is about our youth and our unhoused population. Um, we have over a thousand students currently within the city um, that are facing homelessness. So there's a lot of different aspects that we're trying to cover and different things that we're trying to address. And it varies from mental health to substance use as well as just medical conditions for people. And then also the increasing cost of living throughout the city as well as the state and the nation. Um, I'm happy to answer questions about that information. There's plenty of handouts if you guys want them. Um, but I won't read through all of it. There is a lot of information on there. Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys have. Um, two quick questions uh, concerning the homeless population here in Brockton. Uh, can you comment on how the development is going for the, uh, uh, the National Rad Alley on uh, Gannon Street uh, in terms of the development there, uh, how it's progressing, and who's going to be housing? And also, I heard uh, uh, word to the effect that there's a possibility that they're looking for an expansion in terms of building on the roadway, and I think it's called uh, Belmont Street. Any comments on those two things? So I'm not specifically included in those. However, I do know that the Manly Street project is coming along on schedule for how quickly they want to open it. It'll be a housing resource center, so it'll have all the resources that people need to access housing and different resources during the day so they'll be able to stay in. It's also going to be the new location for the Main Spring Shelter, so it'll be relocating there. Um, and then there'll be housing units similar to the other housing units they have throughout the city. And there's a very um, strict guideline that they have to follow for who gets housed and those sent down from us to us from the state. And it goes through a continuum of care. So people have to meet certain guidelines. Some of the units, they have to be chronically homeless. So either homeless for a year or more, or I believe it's four, three or four periods within a certain period of time that add up to a year. Um, as well as they have to be considered disabled. They have to meet the income restrictions. There's a lot that goes into it. Um, but that's how they decide typically who would get housed in those. And typically they do an open lottery process for that type of housing. A quick follow-up to that. Is there any preference for each Brockton resident? So for those units, the question is, is there any preference given to Brockton residents? It depends on the voucher. So some of the units will be one voucher, some of them will be others. Some give preference, others it's just whoever is within the pool of people that are being selected from that lottery. Okay. Um, so it depends, but oftentimes there is a preference. It's almost like a point system, and so whoever has the most points is typically who would be at the top of the list for those. And then you had one other question. Mm -hmm. Well, just the expansion of uh, the roadway in possibly. So the expansion of the roadway in. So I know that there is going to be a community meeting to discuss that. I believe Phil Griffin is holding that. Um, <coughs> April 30th. So that'll be April 30th. Okay, thank you. Yes. Uh, the plan of presentation is on the community use camp directed by this, but last week I went to the VA site was that it's not going to accommodate any kind of housing. It's just a processing and office facility. It's not that big. So that building will have housing attached to it. Is housing going to be grouped in there? Yeah, so it'll be shelter and housing together as well as some office space. So the question was for the Manly Street location. Um, 
will it pretty much be functioning the same way as the mainspring shelter does now with certain times and guidelines for people being inside, and then if there's going to be transportation provided? That I cannot answer. So mainspring is a private entity. I would guess that they're going to function similarly to how the shelter functions now, where people will have the option instead, which they don't currently, they can stay in all day at this program because there's resources to be accessed. Um, but I would assume if people choose to leave, they would still have to be in by a certain time, get searched, and then be able to go to the shelter. And what about transportation? That I also don't. I don't know what the functioning that they're going to be changing for this, knowing that there's a bigger distance to resources now. It's something I can look into on our end, but I can't speak for them, unfortunately. Maybe you could let them know. And the other question is, what's going to happen with the mainspring current building? I'm also not sure what's going to happen with the current mainspring building, but I would recommend reaching out to our planning department, Rob May, and he would probably be able to give you more information about that. <coughs> I'll do that. I, I would suggest that it, the news has been out for quite some time that the, uh, the BAT system is going to expand to robust with that. Over a year ago, when they were initially talking about this uh, at the meeting at the Garner Elm School, um, the head of, uh, of Main Street said that the, the day planes were once that that was up and running, that the old Main Street uh, Main Spring location was going to go up for sale. I'm surprised you're not aware of that. So I am aware that the property will go up for sale, but it's a matter of who they choose to sell it to, what will then happen with that building. I can't answer that because it's not for sale yet. Um, there's also a lot of things that are going into that. And I can't speak to those things. That's not something that my job entails, unfortunately. Uh, I can only speak to the social services aspects of everything. So I have a two cents to that. Um, Mainspring merged with Father Bill's Place, which is based in Quincy some time ago. And in Quincy, as Quincy rehabilitated their downtown, shiny and new all over again. The question was, what will we do with Father Bill's Place property? And what ended up happening was, Quincy took it by eminent domain so that they could once and for all eliminate it from their downtown area. I believe they tore it down, I believe. Now, will we be in a position to do that in a few years? I don't know. But that would be on the table as well as them selling it. One thing I know for sure is this, the downtown area truly won't be revitalized until that that housing, that shelter goes away. Yes. Probably going to be moved some part of the verse by the time the meeting gets to you. And you'll know that soon. Uh, I understand that there is a major homeless encampment at WPO Park. I also understand that there is state is quote unquote high in your hands because you can't do anything about it. The park closes at X time. The park opens at X time. Anyone in the park at those uh, other non-open times are trust at plain and simple. You also have a homeless encampment up on the uh, banks of Route 24 up by the shield place. So I'd like to believe it's where the Kidney dialysis center is. And you know, sooner or later something's going to happen and people are going to start to die. You know, it's our tax money that is supporting them. And right now you've got a situation at Broadway High School with $44 million in debt, basically overspending. We've got no way out, and the only way a government can raise money is through. So specifically to the encampment in DW that you're referring to, um, myself and an intern from Bridgewater State University were actually up there today cleaning one of the encampments because we are preparing to get rid of a very large amount of trash that has accumulated. And within this week, actually, the state has been reviewing a certain law that they're looking into that has been passed in other districts and other states. Um, and that law basically tells you whether or not you can criminalize some of the well, there's also a Supreme Court case coming out this weekend. I believe it's uh, Grove Pass. 
Yes, so that's the little one that we are currently waiting to hear information from. So they started that this week. They started doing testimonials within the last couple of days. Um, and it's not so much that our hands are tied as much as well, if we were can't do anything about it, they're tying the hands. Well, if we were to remove people from public property, it is considered illegal currently. However, that if this law comes to whatever they decide, that could change. So the process that we are following right now is we can ask people if they are willing to go to shelter and relocate. If they say no and they're on public property, we cannot stop them. As for the park, this federal law right now overrules any signage that we put up as far as whether or not people can camp within the park or not. So these are all things that we're monitoring very closely. And we've been working on that. Or else to them from harassing residents up there? So if there's any illegal activity that takes place, I can call the police, you can call the police, we can report those. <laughs> So that's something that if you want, you can reach out to our office and I can address with them. I work with several people personally, and I'm happy to do that. We have people that complain about them panhandling all the time. Uh, we've had people report them selling or using drugs in public. And the second I reach out, we are able to get a response to those things, and we have been addressing them. I cannot speak to the actions of people other than myself, unfortunately. But it is a situation that we are working on. We're also working on making sure that we're cleaning the encampments that are there until we have further guidance on what we can do about them. We can at least make sure that they're clean and they're not damaging the surrounding property. Two questions, sorry. One is about the cleanup. Is that part of the DPW cleanup, the 24-hour notice that they're going to be doing downtown as opposed to where you Yes. So the question was, is the cleaning in DW right now is part of the DPW ordinance that was proposed and no. So it was just myself and an intern. We worked with the people in the encampment and we're stacking all the trash bags. And then the DPW has just agreed to come pick them up for us so we can start cleaning up a lot of the trash that's in the area. That ordinance still hasn't been passed. We're working on changing some of the language for that and making it more inclusive. Because um, we do have encampments on this portion of the city, so it's something that needs to be citywide and cover everything. Um, and that's one of the things that we've been working on the language for to ensure that it's all inclusive. So the DPW wouldn't even be part of the downtown ordinance, right? So for the downtown ordinance, they would be the actual people removing the trash for the ordinance. Um, I would be accompanying them to provide services, kind of talk people through that process and explain what's happening. And then the idea would be that DPW and the Parks Department, depending upon the location, would help clean. Um, DPW specifically would do like under the bridges if this ordinance was to pass. Okay. And the other question is, as was just stated, it's illegal to camp on public ground. I mean, it, if it's not illegal for them, and yet it's illegal for me because I have a residence, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, I'd be arrested for camping in the park, but they're not. So you could be arrested for having someone living on a trailer on your property. Exactly. So in regards to that, at this time, you would not be imprisoned if you chose to camp in the park. No one can be penalized or punished for being homeless. We can't stop people from doing those things, and that's part of the concern. So the federal ruling as of right now overrules any signage we put up, any current laws we have that could penalize someone for being homeless and outside. And that's where we're having the struggle of trying to figure out where we can kind of like push people along if someone's able to access shelter or not. Um, if someone's willing to access shelter or not, and people do have the free will to choose if they're going to go in or not, we can only ask them. So we have to wait for this ruling to tell us what we can do in the future and further guidance. But we are working with our law department on additional options that we'll have to see if there are different ways we can handle this without impeding on people's rights. But it, my point is that I'm as a, as a resident, as having someone somewhere to live, I can't go camp on that I'd be arrested or moved off without any hesitation by the police department because I've got an address. And it just, it just doesn't make any sense. So the main aspect of the ruling is if someone has an address to go back to, then we're able to remove them because they have alternative shelter. We don't have enough shelter beds right now to accommodate the number of people we have outside, so we can't move people until we do have enough shelter beds. That's the problem that we're facing. Yeah, I just want to say thank you to what you're doing. I know what your job is probably one of the most difficult jobs in the city. Right? Dealing with human nature is something that is hard to be doing. 
My question, well, two questions. My first question is, with all your out outreach and going out to places, are you finding your other, is there, is there anyone you're getting out of that situation, or is it just helping them maintain that situation, giving them aid, or are we finding that they're able to get to some people to get out of that ecosystem? Repeat so, the question. So my question was that with all the outreach that Jasmine's done and spoken to people, it's been reaching out to these people who are homeless or, or living in shelters around the city, are, there, are you connecting with any people that are getting out of that ecosystem and, and getting out of it being back into the regular part of our, our, our society? So specifically for that, since January, we have been able to successfully house and maintain housing for four people. Oh, that's great. Uh, I'm not sure of the exact total for last year. We're working on getting that information, but there are people that are responsive to the information. They just choose not to access shelter or camp for various reasons, such as some of PTSD, some people are suspended from shelter. Um, some people aren't from this area, so they don't even know that the shelter's there. It just depends. What about shelters? Are they connecting with family, or is that happening at all? Or? So Mainspring does allow us, so if we can confirm that someone has a family member that is willing to let the person stay with them, Mainspring will help us cover costs to get that person back to family so that they would then house successfully. Oh, that's great to know. So there's solutions to getting people out of that ecosystem. My next thing is just a comment on the law. The Ninth, Cir the, the Ninth Federal Circuit Court of Appeals, over a decade ago, ruled that if there's people who don't have places to shelter, that you get to you get to shelter on public property, provided the municipality does not have any sh is, is maxed out its shelter. Okay, oh, let me finish speaking. I know. The I thing is, the law. Hold on. The law is about sheltering, not domicile. You've seen all across the country other lawsuits about municipalities, especially in Lowell and Lawrence, they get nabbed at it because they were criminalizing homeless people. You can't criminalize people who need a shelter. But that Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals is not about domicile. You don't get to domicile. Other communities who said to homeless people, hey, you can shelter here, but you gotta get up, pack up, and move out during the day. They've been able to do that. The other thing about those laws, not criminalizing, criminalizing homelessness, but there are Board of Health laws. Rules and regulations about trash and stuff. I did go to that site at DW, on the south side of DW, which abuts the uh, Westgate Mall, which is a huge encampment. There's, there's hundreds of bottles full of human <coughs> urine, waste. Now, I want people, if they need to shelter on public land, to shelter on public land. I want that. I'd love to see them all sheltering on city hall property, and then leaving on after every day and not making a mess. The law is very clear. We as a municipality do have the legal right to go in and say you don't get to destroy what the park was meant to be. You get to shelter here, but you don't get to camp out, you don't get to do those things. But unfortunately, not you, but others who are running our city don't want to take that step because that means you've got to be accountable of your actions. And yeah, all that trash in DW should not be there. That's, a, that's definitely, well beyond the scope of the federal government or the state government tying our hands. No one's tying our hands in solving this issue or minimizing the ecosystem. And if we were to proactively make sure people who are sheltering in our community don't bring in trash and junk and stolen carriages and are proactive, proactively doing it, when it happens, guess what? The ecosystem stops. The behavior does get minimized. It's happened in other communities. And I hope that this new ruling that's going to be happening in the Supreme Court in the next weeks will clarify for community to say, yeah, yeah, you can use your municipal laws about trash in Board of Health. Unlike where Lawrence, they criminalize homeless people. We're not going to criminalize people, but there's definitely people up there in the park domiciling and completely breaking all kinds of natural laws outside of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. And until we can get the city people, people running our community to say, yeah, you know, we do have the law, we've got the accountability, and we can have people like Jasmine know how to deal with these, these, these individuals in a nice, professional, and caring way, but get still maintaining the community for who? You and I and me who aren't sheltered, who are sheltering our homes, who want to help these people to get out of the shelter system. And it can be done. I commend you for what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yes, there's an excessive amount of trash, there's an excessive amount of human feces, bottles of urine, needles, everything. So when we were sifting through everything today, we provided trash bags and we tried
trying to clear out a lot of the needles to make sure that the DPW right. is stuck when they're cleaning. So we need to have someone in city government going to these people saying, <coughs> you're bringing all the trash, we're coming in here to get rid of it tomorrow. Not every nine months. Yeah. We do this every nine months. Right. Every nine months. That's now, we, we've now created an ecosystem for this type of behavior. So within the last couple weeks, we mapped out and have identified every single campsite that we were able to in the south end of the park. We identified how many tents there were and about how many people are at each location so that we're able to better monitor going forward the trash situation because we did reach out for quotes of what it would cost to have it cleaned professionally and they were insane. So we cannot allow that to happen again. So what my hope is, and I hope we're able to push forward like you mentioned, is to come up with additional options of like, possibly people can move along during the day or then come back at a certain time or monitor the trash, so. As a suggestion, which I've said for years, if we had a full-time park ranger in DW Field Park managing the park, you'd have someone on, on eyes there all the time going, sorry, you can't do this, sorry, you can't do this. Full-time park ranger. Hi, uh, yeah, I have a question about related to um, homeless. So the reason I'm asking, how do you guys get information from the law enforcement and um, other cities um, responses in, in about the homelessness in the private property? The reason I'm asking, because I live on Summer Street and there's a place there. I was actually gonna come and ask if Susan had any information on their property, what's the plan on their property, because there is homeless living there. And um, last year, the firefighter police has been called to the area many times because there was lighting fires and the fires go up and it was like every, at least three times a week. And this is in the middle of the night, one o'clock in the morning and we all sleeping, waking up with the firefighters, police, and everything. But I never heard if they doing anything about it, and they still camping there. This has been going on for over a year. So I know they was playing with that place before. It was supposed to be um, some kind of solar panel um, facility, but I, we never heard anything about it. I don't know if you remember, it's six, 634 Summer Street, so this is like over four years ago that we, we had received letters that it was supposed to be a, sol a solar panel there. Never happened. And this is right behind the, the Dave Scomo. So the people pass by there and um, they dump the trash there. And now we have homeless living there. Very strange people parking uh, um, across the street from my house. And it's just, I just want to know how do you guys get those kind of information, not just in the, in the city, you know, in the in main area over there, but do you guys get information from other areas of the city? Are we working on anything about it? Yeah, so that's one of the locations we visit on a regular basis. Um, it's usually myself and a police officer. It is privately owned property, so I don't know what the plans for the property are. I do know when we have reached out and tried to get permission to remove the encampments off the property, we are not getting a response from the owner. Um, whether that is, it's just not a priority for them, they're not getting the messages, I'm not really sure. Um, there's little I can do on private property without permission. Um, as far as fires, illegal activity, we had people that had let us know that they were walking through their backyards. Um, when children were outside playing, things like that, those can be addressed by the police department, which is why I typically bring them with me, especially for private property situations. Um, when we've gone out, oftentimes people are not there or they are hiding just because of safety concerns for themselves. Um, but when stuff like that happens, if you're seeing stuff, if you take photos, get information, and you send that to our office, and my business card is up here if you want to reach out. Um, I can put all that information together and try reaching out to the property owner again, let them know the concerns that people are having. Um, I do know there's been multiple very large fires, including several structure fires where tents have burned down, um, which is a very large concern because it's a very heavily wooded section. Um, so we are canvassing it regularly up there, usually at least once a week. Um, but I can always stop in if you reach out and check on something very specific at the time, so just let us know. 
Um, as far as the information, I get a lot of my information from the police, C-click fix, calls to our office, emails, um, anonymous information, people come in sometimes. So wherever people are seeing a problem is where we typically go and we just bring whatever departments are needed to address those specific areas. So for like DW, we have police and board of health. Um, for something like where you're talking about, it would be myself and police and then board of health after the fact to address the trash that's gonna be piling up. And oftentimes the fire department. Where's that location she's speaking of? 634 Summer Street. Don't talk 634 Summer Street. Yeah. Yes. If you have the Board of Health um, going out there and addressing it, they don't have a problem with feces and pee and needles all over the place? I don't get that. And trash? Why so, are they doing anything? So the question was if, if all of those things are present at encampments, meaning feces, Biological contaminants, trash, etc. Why isn't the Board of Health doing stuff? So it's very hard to cite somebody that does not have an address because there's nowhere to send it to. But what happens is they continue to come with me on regular trips, and we're out there multiple times a week trying to figure out the best ways to address those situations, and then also working with the DPW to try to get them clean. The problem is a lot of the biological contaminants we need different services to come and address. So to make sure that like that section of DW can be cleared once that encampment's gone and those people are in housing, there's gonna be a lot of work to make sure that all of that's decontaminated and that isn't something that the Board of Health can do, but they can recommend companies to us. And we have worked on that in a few locations. Do they talk to them when they when they're there and say, hey, we understand you're you know you're homeless and we're trying to help you? Absolutely. So myself, Board of Health, whoever's going out, we all are trying to give the same messaging, telling people that, you know, keep the area clean, um, you know, follow all legal, like all legal guidances, laws, everything, make sure that, you know, you're sleeping here and that's what this is for, and then you're going about your business during the day. Um, some people are receptive to that, some are not. We've left trash bags for people in Perkins Park to be able to throw trash away, other camp and locations. And then we arrange for pickups of that trash on a regular basis. Or in DW, there's the trash cans. We just try to tell people, make sure you're bringing your trash to the trash cans, and they'll be emptied on a regular basis. Um, most people are receptive. This specific site is not. Yeah, it's and just I'm been not, a very big challenge. Also, I'm also not thinking, too, we have a lot of people that are homeless that have mental illness. So, yeah, I wasn't, I was like, no, and some of the things, unfortunately, that do come out of the mental health challenges that we're seeing people face is things like um, not retaining the information about like daily living tax. So you have trash sheets to be thrown away over here. If you leave it out, it attracts animals, it attracts bugs. It makes the situation unhealthy. Um, so we see higher rates of people being hospitalized for different things. Um, and it is something that we're working on addressing. It's just you have to go to each person individually to provide yeah, services. Yeah, So the first question was, what is the projected 
kind of plan for underneath the bridges, uh, which is a very large safety concern that we've been seeing. Um, currently, we're working on the cleaning ordinance, would, which would include cleaning under the bridges on a scheduled basis or as needed if biological contaminants appear or if there's excessive amounts of trash. We are working on rephrasing that ordinance to be more inclusive citywide. So that's something that is currently being worked on and looked at by our law department. Um, and then a lot of what happens is I also do regular outreach to underneath the bridges. And something that we're noticing is I would say maybe 30% of the people that you see under the bridge during the day are homeless, while the rest are people that are just hanging out. A lot of times it's people selling drugs, buying drugs, um, generally just loitering. And sometimes they can be quite violent. Mm -hmm. um, that's been a concern of people that I that sometimes um, hear people are stopping to go get the traffic, and then sometimes in the midst of um, there are even people that have been um, threatening. So what should the plan be? What do you recommend for citizens that um, go this path, or need to go this path? And So the section under the bridges, there's the sidewalk, and then there's an additional lip. That lip, we are working with the MBTA right now to identify whether the city owns it or if the MBTA owns it. If the MBTA owns it, it technically could be considered private property, which would give us the option to move people along. They would not be able to stay under the bridge anymore. Um, they also would not be able to stay on the sidewalk underneath the bridge because it interferes with the safe passing of people getting by. However, we understand that a lot of people do not have shelter otherwise. Um, so it's been regular monitoring on my end just of who's under there, trying to keep an idea of you know, what their interests are, if they're willing to work on housing stuff, but just trying to make sure that they understand that we, are, we do see them and that we're trying to provide resources to who wants them. And if people are not homeless, trying to move them along because then they are loitering. Um, it's been very difficult just because we don't have a clear answer on whose property that is yet. Um, there's also some safety concerns about people sleeping under there. The stone that is being used there as water seeps through it causes a chemical concern for people. It can cause burns or irritation to people's skin. And then also if people light fires underneath the bridge, the fires are heating up the cement that's holding those stones together and could be a structural concern. So the fire department has been working very closely with us and the MBT on different options for what we can do. Um, there's been projects proposed for art installations that would block off that small section to make sure that people don't have access to it. Um, moving people along during the day and telling them they can't come back until a certain time. Different things like that. Um, a lot of which will be influenced by the court ruling that we're waiting for, as well as some of the different health concerns that we're seeing, if we can use some of that information to justify whether or not we're allowed to move people because they are at risk of being in that area. Um, we're also been seeing an increased hostility. People have been throwing bottles at the people sleeping under there at times. Um, like you said, people panhandling, banging on car windows, things like that. Um, so there's a lot that we've had to address in that specific area. And we've been able to keep several of the bridges with lower activity. But what happens is they kind of bounce from bridge to bridge as we move people along. So we're just trying to work on making sure that people understand they have access to shelter and different resources. Um, but several of the people that were under the bridge are the people that we were able to house since January. Um, so people are responsive to some of that. It's just, it's gonna be a very multifaceted approach. And we kind of need those outside partners to work with us so we know what our rights are. Um, and then for your other question, as far as the other cities and towns, We've done a lot of research as far as what they're doing. A lot of the places in the area do not get their own funding to address the homeless. So Mainspring has a catchment area of multiple cities and towns, and everyone that's homeless in those places would access Mainspring here for their main shelter location, or they could go to Boston uh, because those places don't have their own shelters. Could you repeat that just, just so people understand? Yeah, so Mainspring has a catchment area, and then Father Bills also has one. So Mainspring, I think it's like 12 cities and towns, and then Father Bills has their own, and then Boston covers all of the Boston districts. So each de designated shelter location 
services a certain population. So everyone in those 12 cities or towns would be serviced by Mainspring, and that goes as far out as Wareham, and it's a very specific list, but those people would all access services here, and then we would work with them on housing because they don't have their own shelter systems, um, which can make it very challenging because when we do like our point in time count, people don't always understand why we have so many people identifying from other places, and it's because they would access their services here. So, so you're, saying, you're saying that the increased amount of people needing service in this community is not necessarily because they are from this community or in this community, it's because the other communities in Plymouth Town here geographically around us don't have services and Mainspring is doing all their work here in Brockton. Yes, so Mainspring would be the hub here. They kind of, we get a very large portion of the funding for this area. Quincy gets a large portion and then obviously Boston gets one of the largest amounts in the state. Um, they also have a lot more people and a lot more shelter systems that they're able to facet people through. And Boston can take people from other locations, but we try to make sure that people are in the specific area where they're supposed to get services. Um, but we do research a lot of the information with towns. Boston's solution currently has been working pretty effectively. It's just very expensive, so everyone was given specific services to like store their belongings and they were sent somewhere. And we just don't really have the capacity for something like that, but we are looking at different options that people have used to see if we can kind of minimize you know, how many people are outside um, and what that will look like, making sure people have the resources they need. Um, but it is very collaborative with a lot of places in the area. Is there a thought where I can understand that other towns don't have the resources, but it seems like we don't have the capability. It seems like we may be getting funding but at some point it seems like our load is just way too heavy. So what is the thought or is there a thought of saying, we know we're being offered the money, but it's not outweighing the consequence, you know, the benefits because we seem to be, um, there seems to be an overload. So is there a thought of saying, okay, maybe we don't take all of this money, maybe the money should go to another town and they can open up another center. And some of this, um, some of the people could be housed there because it seems like we're, something is not working. It seems like we are not at capacity. We don't have the, the, the resources. We don't have the manpower. We don't have the shelter. It seems like we should stop taking the funding or maybe limit it and maybe offer, that's another partnership <coughs> idea, to another town so that they can also have share this load. So in that situation, the state identifies who gets the funding. So we actually get a very low amount considering the amount of resources we have in the area. If we had increased funding, we would be able to make a much bigger impact on how many people are being housed. But in addition, with the increased cost of living, rental prices going up, a lot of people just can't afford to live here. And so then it's a matter of trying to get them housed somewhere else. And a lot of times landlords, the second they find out that you're from Mainspring, they don't want to take people. Have, have there been any discussions in your team about maybe creating a, a public space for sheltering? So it was definitely looked at. So the question was if there had been any discussion about creating a public space for sheltering. A lot goes with that. So there's a lot of liability that the city would take on if we identify a space for people. Um, we also have to make sure that we're providing certain resources like restrooms, other facilities, how are people being fed, things like that. We don't have the funding for that because the funding goes directly to the agencies that work on the homeless situation and not to the city itself. Um, but it has been a lot of discussion if there's a possibility that that's something we would be able to do. Well, maybe in the back of the table. In the next step. I'm not sure if my question is for Susan or for you, but I heard panhandling come up a couple of times. And my concern is that to have a city ordinance that made panhandling illegal. In 2019, the city council voted it out. What's it take to get it back in? Because right now, it seems like when I come out of work, I have everybody surrounding my vehicle. Uh, I work at the school department, so I come out, I'm coming down on Crescent Street, and they are literally in between the two uh, aisles, which is safe for cars, and they're, they're, they're not jumping on my car, but I don't want them owning my house and me becoming homeless because now they're, I, you know, I've hit them. 
it's, it's horrible. The, um, there's the same people every day. I see them at 6.30 in the morning, and I see them at 4.30 in the afternoon. And it's there. I mean, it must be lucrative, okay, because it's everybody from City Hall that's coming out, everybody from the telephone company there, and everybody from City Hall from the school department. So there's a lot of cars coming in and out. I just think that maybe if it were illegal or somebody would stop them from maybe coming right out to the middle of the street, I don't know what the answer is, but I don't think the answer was to take the ordinance out. So the question was, would it be possible to reinstate the panhandling ordinance that had made panhandling illegal? Um, in very like, brief summary, unfortunately, the ordinance was revoked because panhandling is considered a constitutional right. So it violated the rights of people to choose how and when they make money. What we are able to do, um, and I move people along all the time, I'll roll my window down, be like, get out of the street. If people are in the road, um, I do notify the police department, and as it continues to happen, they can move people along and tell them they're not allowed to be in that area for the rest of the day. Um, and a lot of times, they will move, unfortunately, they'll move to a new spot, but as people continuously have that issue and they're interfering with traffic, um, we are getting constant complaints about the same people most of the time. So it is something that we're working on finding ideas to work around, but it is very difficult because it was a constitutional right that was brought up. So what about the middle of the street? So th we can move them along through the middle of the street. That's illegal. They have to stay on the sidewalk. Um, they are not allowed to impede on traffic in any way. Which they do. So yes. is, it, is that possible to get somebody down there perhaps uh, every morning and every afternoon to move them maybe back into the park? It's definitely something I can ask about. Thank you. What about nuisance laws? Approximately 210 plus, and that is give or take. As it gets warmer, you'll see more people. A lot of people come from Boston because they don't feel as safe. When it gets cold, they tend to go back to their shelter locations again. If you say there's 200 or so, how come uh, Main Spring gives 263 meals on a Thursday night? So Main Spring gives meals out to the community as well. So it's not just the people sleeping in the shelter. If people are in need and come to the door, they will provide additional meals to people. Of that population, how many do you anticipate are drug or alcohol addicted and how many are mental health issues? So out of that population, I would say a good 30 to 40% probably have severe substance use because um, we do have people that only does sound odd only socially use. Um, so it depends, give or take. As far as mental health, I would say it's a very large portion. It's probably closer to 60 or 70 percent. Um, obviously, being in the shelter and experiencing homelessness tends to exacerbate symptoms that people might not have had prior. So sometimes things will show up when people are in shelter and then dissipate once they're housed again. Um, so some of those conditions are temporary, whereas other ones for people are long term chronic conditions. We could go on all night about this because it's a complicated and fascinating and troubling subject. But let's give Jasmine a round of applause. Thank you. She's doing a job for all of us. Feel free to take one um, as you're leaving. Uh, talk to her when we finish. I just wanted to have a few minutes to speak to you. Um, this topic of the unhoused is huge and, and we have plenty in Ward 4. As the young woman in the back talked about on Summer Street, they've been reported. 
They've been reported along the river, okay, behind the Windies and thereabouts. Some have, have lately been taken to sleeping on the porch at Cushman Insurance, but we think we got that under control. Um, and they're everywhere in the city, and that's why there's a proposed ordinance right now to focus on uh, stepping up the cleaning in the downtown to address the trash that the, that the homeless leave behind. And I've told the sponsor of it, it has to be for the whole city because it's a whole city problem. And also, and also if, we, if we do this to discourage them from being downtown, they'll only end up in Ward 4 and other places in the city. So let's just make a law that will really be real up front. So before I close, oh, and you were great. Both of you are great. Before I close, I wanted to talk about some other issues. It was important to me tonight to focus on issues other than what's happening in the schools and, and financial issues because um, I'm just overwhelmed by them and I'm sure all of you are. That seems to be what so much of our, our media coverage is about. We've got problems. We have financial problems in the city that are resulting from deficiencies in the school department budgets that we didn't know about. And we're, the, the mayor's office and the council we're, and the school committee, we're working very hard with the school administration to figure it out and to figure out, at the, at, you know, what is the bottom line? How much are the deficiencies and how are we going to cobble together the funds to address them? And who is going to help us? Will the state help us? Will the feds help us? We'll see. And how much of this will we have to bear ourselves? There are plenty of unknowns, but they will, by and large, be coming to a head because we do our budget, our annual budgets, in the month of June. And so stay tuned. Keep calling me with your questions and your concerns because I do my best to get answers for everyone. Um, what did I want to talk to you about else? There are additional problems in the schools, of course. We, we have, you know, repeated incidents of violence in the schools and at the high school. There was another um, incident of violence today involving some adolescents wearing masks and a child who was really hurt by them. It has to be addressed. I'm told by the principal, I spent some time with him last Friday, it is being addressed, but just as it takes time for these problems to come up, it takes time to address them and to mitigate them. And so um, I know everyone here is, is concerned. I know so many of you are products of the Brockton schools. We know how good it can be. Um, keep us in your prayers and, and keep in touch with me about these things. Those are the big problems for me, and of course the quality of life problems that so many of you call me about. And I'm working on them, I'm addressing them. I'm the biggest nag to most of the, the, the uh, department heads in City Hall because things like potholes and roads and neighborhood problems and zoning violations, I just don't think they should be. We have a lot of opportunists in the city who try to take advantage of our neighbors and, and we're doing our best to address them as they come up. I don't know if anyone has any questions for me. Perhaps I'll take them at the end, okay? But I wanted to, before we go to questions, I just wanted to say there are two events that Peg Kearney is here to speak about and why don't I just tell them about it, Peg, since we're coming to the end, okay. Um, we have 300 miles of roads in the city. We're going to have Keep Brockton Beautiful Day on Saturday, May 18th, specifically to address our city areas and our roads, pick up the trash. The Department of Public Works cannot do it all. And so I ask all of you to do what you can to get involved in Keep Brockton Beautiful Day. Um, you can go to Heights Crossing, which is up near the mall, and, and register to help. You can borrow some supplies if you don't have them. Bring them back, and then there'll be a cookout at 12 noon that day. Um, also on Saturday, May 18th. Can I say one thing? Of course. Um, I just yeah. posted on the Kim. That's all right. I just posted on the Campella website. No, Facebook page. 
if there are groups within camp palo that would like to do some place within camp palo there's an i'll leave these flyers on the table or you can just call the reese the refuse center as we know the recycle center they will bring you bags and they will give you picker upper thingies you thank you um you can do that and you call them back and they will come and pick up the bags you can do that anytime but um if you would like to really get a group together um, you can either go to heights crossing or you can do something in your own neighborhood and i don't mean you know like what we were talking about a few minutes ago i'm just talking about regular street trash type of thing and it's a lot of fun to do in groups and the benefit of registering is they will give you these bright blue bags that they only use on days like this and then if you give them an idea of where you're going to be they'll come up and they'll pick up the trash for you you don't have to you can just leave it there and they'll they'll gather it and on the same day throw it away all in the same day that's right also on saturday may 18th in the morning the brockton garden club is having their plant sale and we all love that plant sale and i'm kind of disappointed that it conflicts with the cleanup, but we do our best, right? Does anyone have questions for me? Mr. Farrell. Go ahead. I was going to say this. They were on Price Park in Brockton High School. I don't know if a lot of people know. The uh, Brockton Coral won gold in yes. uh, the concert, and the Alive Quiet, and then the Brockton uh, Wind Ensemble won gold. That's right. There's many bright spots. And I've been told by someone in the administration there's maybe 200 children at Brockton High School who, who are causing issues. But there's a total of 3,600 children there. And it's a shame for those 3,400 children to be penalized or be thought less of because of these few. So remember that. Someone else? Mr. White? Yeah, I've got three quick questions for just development here in the ward. Uh, anything new on the White Pines uh, Golf Course at all? Nothing. Not so far. I checked out last Friday. Second one, is there anything uh, going on for the uh, Kmart Plaza? I think they, they, uh, that it's, it's, their lease still runs for another, probably a little less than a year to have renewed. But the, quest, the question is, is there anything going on at the Kmart Plaza? Nothing more than what you see. There was a rumor going around social media that, that migrants were going to be housed there. And I spoke to the owner of the plaza, and at my request, he called the property manager for Kmart. There are no such plans. And, and the third location, um, which I think is already approved, uh, but I was just wondering when the uh, building is supposed to start for uh, where Lynch's towing was, uh, of the apartment complex, I guess, that got approved by the city to go in there. Everything has been cleaned out from that location. I was just curious when that's supposed to start. The, the location at the end of Montello Street, the former Lynch's, towing and service. Um, it was sold to NeighborWorks. We had a groundbreaking um, a few weeks ago. It was a very cold day. And uh, they should be starting soon. They have all their permits. They're ready to roll. Very good. Thank you. Mr. Nixon. <coughs> yeah. um, can you, uh, Point Street and Auto Street, is there any way like a bar for light to be set up there? Because you can sit there this, at least a half a dozen times a day. There are close misses as far as from cars and people. It's a blind spot from, from either side. Uh, is there any way something could be set up to uh, slow the drivers down? I'm working on it. Plain Street and Auto Street, it's very hard to turn on to Plain Street from Auto Street. Tomorrow night at 6 o'clock is a traffic commission meeting. And it's on the agenda. I got it on the agenda. I'd love for you to appear and speak to it. Uh, one of the gentlemen who left, Buster, has also talked to me about that quite frequently. The other problem is that property on the corner there if you want to take a left. The bushes are so high it's very hard to see over them. DPW has actually gone in and cut those bushes in the past. So 6 o'clock tomorrow night at the Arnon School in the auditorium. Come and join me as we work on that. Someone else? Uh, yes. <laughs> at Meadowbrook there's a facility for recovery if you will of alcoholism drugs. There was a team program there, and it, it kind of disappeared. 
you know that's been replaced or they didn't have funding? Do you, can you tell us anything about that? So the CASEL program is the program that closed on the Meadowbrook campus um, that service teens that were experiencing substance use. They have some new inpatient programming that's aimed at our youth. Um, I don't have the exact name, but I can get that information and send it to Counselor DeCastro for anyone that's interested. Um, but they do have a replacement program that offers the same level of intensive care for everybody inpatient, um, but it is expanded and can house more people now. And so that area is vacant, correct? That part of it? I'm not sure what they're using that building for. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. question is about Thatcher Street and the approved project on the grounds of the, the Sisters of Jesus Crucified Con Convent. And um, actually, the trees that were cut down, that land is separately owned. That land is owned by Doug King yeah, okay. and George Carney. Is that going to be like a cemetery? And That's what I heard a few years ago, but I have not heard anything since. Okay. All the trees are probably back, by the way. I'm sure. And, yeah, I'm sure. And the Thatcher Street project should be breaking ground pretty soon. They've gotten the bulk of their tax credits, they've gotten their financing together. So we should be seeing some movement there. I think definitely this year. And you had shared the plans a couple of years ago. Is it pretty much the way that it was presented then? It is so far so far. The form of all because if they're going to change their plans, they have to come back to the planning board. The form of ownership may change. There's several um, two-story buildings, like townhouses they were going to build. The state suggested to them that they make it condominiums. Okay. So ownership as opposed to rentals, which I'd be all, that would be bad, yes. Yeah. So I'm waiting to hear more about that. We'll get all that information when they announce a breakfast. Thank you for having me. Oh, thanks for joining us. This evening, he had subcommittee meetings and he was unable to attend. But I did reach out to him and ask him to come. Pat? Yeah, question and a comment. Uh, first a comment. With all that's been in the Boston media, if you will, regarding the school and the funding problem, et cetera, uh, kudos should go out. And I'm not sure that someone in the city instigated this, but one of the Boston stations went to Brockton High some very positive pieces regarding programs in the city. Yes, it's we have so many others. There's five concerts this spring you can go to. The jazz concert, they've got a national championship jazz uh, group, and you don't just make it and stay on it. You have to try it every year. They're phenomenal, and I can't even get Vinny to charge $3. That concert's totally free. There's so much in the city that should be exposed that doesn't seem to get there. Although most of you don't know, but U.S. News and World Report has written up programs that this city has that other cities have come to over the last eight years, come into the city to, to learn. And so there's a lot of goodness going on in, this, in the school department. And there's, uh, there's been written up one time in the front page of the New York Times and three times in the Wall Street Journal. So uh, I would love to see if we didn't instigate that thing in Channel 7. I would ask Rob Sullivan or someone to proceed to go to those TV stations and say, we want you to come and talk about this program and that program and expose some of the goodness that's in this city that's getting a bad name. I'll pass that on. And Mother's Day weekend will be the, the, the musical, the annual musical at Rockton High School. There's, I believe, three performances. So mark your calendars. It's um, what is it? The wedding singer. The wedding. wedding singer, yes. I was up there at practice last week. If there's Rob, nothing else, I thank you all. Susan, one last very quick question. Was question, comment. The question was, Hurry, Pat. this is fast. Dave Lynch had talked about having someone come in and build on this property. He wanted to still own it and have them manage it. Did he sell it or did he not sell it? He sold it, and it's all approved, and I think it's going to break ground shortly. Thanks. Mr. Landerholm, Jr. 
three quick questions, but I'll, I'll let you answer as I go. Um, one, it's an easy one. What the hell was with all of the kitty litter that just got spattered all over um, Copeland Street as well as down Woodside? Was there an issue like with oil slick that had to do with that trash truck that came down or something? Mr. Waldron said he lives on Oakside. He thinks it was a trash truck. Okay, are they are they coming back again to do that all over? Because there's still stuff all over Woodside. And, like, the oil I wasn't aware of it. I didn't it's, see it when I walked yesterday. But I'll 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 follow up. I think it happened Friday or Saturday when they were picking up, and they Saturday. came back Monday or Tuesday. Okay. Is I mean, it still there tonight, Paul? I mean, it's. The, the, it looks like they, st of course, I'm down the end of Woodside, so it looks like they stopped. There was a huge pile left, nothing was cleaned up, and then they more or less took off. But the oil slick is still there. It's, I'll send a message when I get home tonight. Okay. Um, the else? second one, I know there was a question about white pines. Is there any talk in the city council of maybe doing what West Bridgewater did, what Braintree's done, and maybe buying white pines outright to turn into a municipal? instead of sending it down the road of adding more houses, which is going to bring the in... The question is about purchasing the land that was formerly known as White Pines Golf Course off Copeland Street. And when, it was a two years ago that they first had preliminary hearings and stuff on that, and I brought it to the mayor and I asked him about it, and actually our former clerk, a ward for a resident, Anthony Zioli, he called me one day and he was going to take me in to show me where the aquifers were. There's places, I guess there's natural underground water under it. I did bring it to the mayor's office. Um, I made them aware of the water, and it, it, there was not an appetite for it at that time. I think it's something to be brought up again, where it's been sitting for so long now, it's you know, kind of like the Serengeti out there. Yeah, it's really something, and I don't know if you can hear it at your house. We hear it at our house. It's a, it's a, win it's a playground for ATVs and minibikes. They're over there all the time, all yeah. Racing up the yeah. Side, across the yeah. Everywhere. Absolutely. Everywhere. Well, they're getting yeah. here from Carl West. Okay. Can that be addressed? Unregistered, unlicensed operators operating On property. private property. And I'm told that the, the owners are aware of it, but. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If they get hurt on that property, the owners are liable. I know they are. Yes. Um, in addition to the social services, I also put together our quality of life task force list every week. We hold the meeting every Thursday morning at 9. So if there's ever situations that come up, um, and I live on Brookside, so I'm, I hear it, it drives my dog insane. She is a basket case because of it. Um, you can call the office and leave that information with me as well and I can make sure that we bring it up every Thursday and that we're addressing those things. Um, there's been a couple of properties that have had their properties damaged because of ATVs, cars, people with motorcycles, all sorts of things, um, that we've been working with them and the police department to address in the area, so. Because there's a vacancy. Mm -hmm. And the mayor 
nominates people to be appointed. So it comes through his office. And I do believe they do some vetting, and some of the counselors do. You know, I look into people um, who are nominated for some things, yes. Thank you. Anybody nominated for storm water? I'm not aware of anyone at this time. So since May of 2023, we've had no storm water I I'm sure they're working on it, and I can ask tomorrow. Uh, if you get an answer, I'd love it. Because sure. Not even answering my phone call. I want to thank everyone being here tonight. Um, I have cards here. I do return phone calls. Not always within the hour, but I am grateful for your attention and your questions and concerns.